how many uh, creationists do we have in the room? Probably none. I think we're all Darwinians. And yet, many Darwinians are anxious, uh, a little uneasy, would like to see some limits on just how far the Darwinism goes. Uh, it's all right, you know, spider webs, sure, they are products of evolution. The World Wide Web, I'm not so sure. Uh, beaver dams, yes, Hoover Dam, no. Uh, well, what do they think it is that prevents the products of human ingenuity from being themselves fruits of the tree of life, and hence, in some sense, obeying evolutionary rules? Uh, and yet, people are interestingly resistant to the idea of applying evolutionary thinking to thinking, to our thinking. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, keeping in mind that we have a lot on the program here. So you're out in the woods or you're out in the pasture and you see this ant crawling up this blade of grass. It climbs up to the top and it falls and it climbs and it falls and it climbs, trying to stay at the very top of the blade of grass. And you think, what is this ant doing? What is this in aid of? What, what goals is this ant trying to achieve by climbing this blade of grass? What's in it for the ant? And the answer is nothing. There's nothing in it for the ant. Well then, why is it doing this? Is it just a fluke? Yeah, it's uh, just a fluke. <laughs> it's a lancet fluke. It's a little brain worm. It's a parasitic brain worm that has to get into the stomach of a sheep or a cow in order to continue its life cycle. So salmon, you know, swim upstream and to get to their spawning grounds, and lancet flukes commandeer a passing ant, crawl into its brain, and drive it up a blade of grass like an all-terrain vehicle. So there's nothing in it for the ant. The ant's brain has been hijacked by a parasite that infects the brain, inducing suicidal behavior. Pretty scary. Well, does anything like that happen with human beings? This is all on behalf of a cause other than one's own genetic fitness, of course. Well, it may already have occurred to you that uh, Islam means surrender or submission of self-interest to the will of Allah. Mm. Well, it's ideas, not worms, that hijack our brains. Now, am I saying that a sizable minority of the world's population has had their brain hijacked by parasitic ideas? Oh, it's worse than that. Most people have. <laughs> there are a lot of ideas to die for. Freedom, if you're from New Hampshire. <laughs> Justice, truth, communism. Many people have laid down their lives for communism, and many have laid down their lives for capitalism, and many for Catholicism, and many for Islam. These are just a few of the ideas that are to die for. They're infectious. Yesterday, Amory Levins spoke about infectious repetitis, and it was a term of, of abuse, in effect. This is unthinking engineering. Well, most of the cultural spread that goes on is not brilliant, new, out-of-the-box thinking. It's infectious repetitus. And we might as well try to have a theory of what's going on when that happens so that we can understand the conditions of, of infection. Hosts work hard to spread these ideas to others. I myself am a philosopher, and one of our uh, <coughs> occupational hazards is that people ask us what the meaning of life is. And you have to have a bumper sticker, you know, you have to have a, you have to have a statement. So this is mine. The secret of happiness is find something more important than you are and dedicate your life to it. 
Most of us, now that the me decade is well in the past, that we actually do this. One set of ideas or another have simply replaced our biological imperatives in our own minds. This is, this is what our sumum bonum is. It's not maximizing the number of grandchildren we have. Now this is, this is a profound biological effect. It's the subordination of genetic interest to other interests, and no other species does anything at all like it. Well, how are we going to think about this? It is, on the one hand, a biological effect, and a very large one, unmistakable. Now, what theories do we want to use to look at this? Well, many theories, but how, what's going to tie them together? The idea of replicating ideas, ideas that replicate by passing from brain to brain. Richard Dawkins, whom you'll be hearing later in the day, invented the term means and put forward the first really clear and vivid version of this idea in his book, The Selfish Gene. Now, here am I talking about his idea. Well, I see, it's not his, yes. He started it, but it's everybody's idea now, and he's not responsible for what I say about means. I'm responsible for what I say about memes. Actually, I think we're all responsible for not just the intended effects of our ideas, but for their likely misuses. So it is important, I think, to Richard and to me that these ideas not be abused and misused. They're very easy to misuse. That's why they're dangerous. And it's a just about a full-time job trying to prevent people who are scared of these ideas from caricaturing them and then running off to one dire purpose or another. So we have to keep plugging away, trying to correct the misapprehension so that only the benign and useful variants of our ideas uh, continue to spread. But it is a problem. We don't have much time, and I'm going to go over just a little bit of this and cut out because there's a lot of other things that are going to be said. So let me just point out. Memes are like viruses. That's what Richard said back in 93. And you might think, well, how can that be? I mean, a virus is a, is, it, you know, it's, it's stuff. What, how can a, how can, what's a meme made of? And yesterday, 